Good morning, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. I also serve on the st steering committee of the Sustainable Energy Coalition. And on behalf of our coalition in ESI, I am proud to welcome you this morning to the 15th Annual Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Technology Expo and Policy Forum. So thank you for joining us this morning. Our first panel is very uh, exciting. It is comprised of speakers from the Department of Defense, and this is an opportunity to hear firsthand from leaders who are talking about the work that is underway that is both advancing mission, security, reducing risk to lives, and is indeed saving taxpayer money and advancing technology. Our first speaker is Dr. Dorothy Robine, who is the Deputy Undersecretary for the Department of Defense, Installation, and Environment. Dorothy? And the three big points that I want to make are that uh, DOD's facility energy effort is all about our being more effective uh, at accomplishing our, our mission. Uh, and we're focused. Uh, on the facility energy side on cost, lowering our energy cost, improving the energy security of our installations. Uh, renewable energy, and we're, you're going to hear a lot this morning about renewable energy, particularly from John and Scott, um, or John and Carrie, is uh, renewable energy is, speaks to the security, energy security on our installations. And I don't talk about renewable energy without talking about microgrids and storage because they go hand in hand. We're not doing renewable energy uh, to be green. We're doing it to make our installations more secure. Um, and then uh, finally, as a, as a technology leader, uh, I think DOD can play a very important role in the uh, country's clean energy revolution by pursuing our own strategic goals and self-interest, which is exactly what we're doing. We are the... Uh, uh, largest energy consumer in the country. We account for 1% uh, of uh, total U.S. energy consumption. Three quarters of the energy that we use is uh, operational energy, fuel. It's used for mobility to power ships, tanks, planes, and generators in theater. So facility energy is uh, a quarter of DOD's uh, energy usage. Our bill last year was uh, $19 billion, up $3 billion from the year before, up almost $4 billion because of uh, higher fuel costs. We care about facility energy at DOD for two big reasons that I uh, alluded to earlier. The first is cost. $4 billion a year um, is a lot of money, even by DOD standards. Uh, so we are working hard to get that down. And then second is uh, energy secure, security of our installations. Our installations provide more direct support for the warfighter than was traditionally the case. Traditionally, our installations were used for, our, and I, when I say installations, I mean fixed installations, permanent installations, as opposed to forward operating bases in theater. Uh, traditionally, we... Uh, used fixed installations to train uh, the warfighter and deploy. Now we are providing much more in the way of direct support for the warfighter. We fly unmanned aerial vehicles from our domestic installations. We fly long-range bombers. We analyze battlefield data in real time. They're a staging platform for humanitarian and homeland defense missions. Our installations are 99% dependent on the commercial electric power grid. Uh, we have typically backup generators with enough fuel to last a uh, matter of days uh, or a week. Um, but there is a growing concern about the, uh, the vulnerability of critical missions to the, uh, to the, the power grid, uh, which, is, which is by experts seen as uh, vulnerable to, uh, to outages for a variety of reasons. So the Defense Science Board in 2008 uh, told us we needed to uh, take this issue seriously. Um, we have a four-part strategy aimed at uh, 
uh, trying to bring down our costs and improve our facility energy security. Uh, and they're, they're overlapping. The first is to reduce demand for traditional forms of energy. Uh, second, expand the supply of renewable and other forms of on-site uh, energy generation. Third, directly address the energy security of our bases. The first two uh, elements indirectly uh, in, improve energy security. And in, in addition, we're trying to do that directly. And I'm going to talk this morning about microgrids. Uh, and then finally, leveraging advanced technology, taking advantage of DOD's uh, comparative advantage. Um, I'm going to say very. I'm going to talk largely on the last, uh, the last two. But uh, just a, a word on, on reducing demand. This really is the most important thing. It's what uh, Secretary of Energy Chu calls the fruit laying on the ground. Uh, and uh, we're, um, uh, it's a big deal for us because we have 300,000 buildings. 300,000 buildings, 2.2 billion square feet of space. That's what drives our $4 billion a year energy bill. Uh, we, have, uh, we have fairly strict rules about new construction. It has to be uh, lead silver, 40% of the points have to come from energy and water, 30% above ASHRAE, a lot of different things. Uh, we're putting, my office is putting out a new United uh, uh, Unified Facilities Code uh, uh, later this year, but we can't build our way out of the problem. This is mostly a an issue for ret retrofit of existing buildings, our existing 300,000 buildings. So we have a billion dollars in the budget uh, for energy efficiency retrofits of existing buildings, and then we are uh, relying heavily on third-party financing of uh, for energy efficiency retrofits. So. And ESPCs and U, U, UESCs. Do you all under, are those, do you understand those initials? No? Okay. Uh, energy savings performance contracts and utility energy savings contracts. This is where a company like Honeywell, uh, Johnson Controls, uh, Con Edison come in, identify potential savings that can lower your electricity bill they pay for the saving. They pay for the capital investment. We get the reduction in energy. They get the savings. They are paid out of the savings in our utility bill that those capital investments bring about. It's a, it's a terrific uh, uh, mechanism if you don't have the money up front to make the investment, which we, which we don't in this austere budget. Um, so we're relying heavily on that, and we're, we're much more aggressively uh, metering our, our buildings, which we historically have not done. Um, I'm going to skip over that. Uh, I'm just going to say a word about our, our second piece, expanding the supply of renewable and on-site energy. This is important when linked to microgrids and storage, which I'm going to talk about. It's not in and of itself renewable energy doesn't give us energy security on our installations. It has to be tied to microgrids and storage, which is why we're doing a lot of uh, work in that, in that area. Um, we've made a, a commitment. Each of the services is committed to do a gigawatt of renewable energy by 2025. That's equivalent to um, the power generated by a nuclear power plant, and John and Carrie are going to talk about that. I'll say three things about it. It's That represents new capacity, capacity that doesn't exist now. Second, that will be power generated on our installations or very close to it. And third, it will almost all be done with third-party financing, so with pri private financing by uh, developers that will, uh, uh, that will operate the, the, the facilities. We provide the land and the, and the demand. I'm going to skip over all of my slides uh, on this, and you'll hear from John and Carrie uh, and talk about about this uh, because I think there there it isn't widely appreciated why, why we are pursuing renewable energy, and it's important to understand why this is important to DoD. 
Um, it, it really is about making our installations more energy secure so that if the grid goes down, uh, we can continue to carry out critical functions. Uh, and the way we will do this is with uh, advanced microgrids, technology that allows us to island, to island critical functions and operate them off of the the, uh, the macro grid, if you will, the larger commercial power grid. My, advanced microgrids, and they don't yet exist, they're, in, they're, they're um, still at the uh, test and evaluation stage, are a triple play for DOD. They will allow us to operate more efficiently and at lower cost on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, by taking advantage of opportunities to it, for demand response opportunities, opportunities to uh, uh, to play in the in the in the power market uh, and reduce our demand at peak periods and and actually make make money doing that. Second, uh, microgrids are a necessary uh, thing if you want to incorporate renewable energy. Uh, and then third, and most important, they, they are the way that we will be able to continue critical functions on a base if the, if the grid goes down. So they're a, uh, they're a triple play. We have microgrids now, but they're rudimentary microgrids. We, we have very rudimentary ones in forward operating bases, but almost by definition, that's how you operate uh, in theater. Uh, but even on our bases here, we have them, but they're fairly rudimentary. We're trying to get uh, from the lower left-hand part of that chart to the upper, upper right-hand, and there are two key elements. The first is being, being more tied in with the grid, with the p larger power grid, so that that's the economic dimension, so that on a day-to-day -day basis, even when, when the grid is operating fine, we can play in these markets. We can, uh, we can make, actually make money by engaging in things called ancillary services and frequency regulation. These uh, allow us to, uh, to operate at lower cost by curbing our demand, by putting power back into the grid from plug-in electric vehicles. There are a variety of things. So that's the economic dimension of, of microgrids. and and. That's important on a day-to-day -day basis. The other dimension, the, uh, the x-axis, is, the, um, is the technological complexity uh, of it, and that has largely to do with the ability to incorporate renewable energy at high penetrations, where, so that renewable energy is accounting for a fairly large uh, portion of the energy used on an installation. And that's the real challenge. That's the technological challenge with microgrids is to incorporate intermittent sources of power at a, at a high level of penetration. And so we're doing a lot of technical work with the major microgrid companies in order to allow us uh, to, uh, to do that. Uh, we have a couple, of, and I'm going to say a little bit more about the technology in a minute. Um, we have uh, a couple of analytic studies underway. Uh, we have um, uh, Lincoln Lab, MIT's Lincoln Lab has, been, has done a survey of all the, the different microgrid plans and efforts underway in the Defense Department, a total of about uh, four dozen. Uh, and they're looking at the trade-offs uh, involved in different uh, microgrid uh, architectures. Uh, and it's, this report will be out literally within the week. And it's, uh, it's, it's technical, but I think it's very helpful for anybody trying to understand the important role of microgrids. Um, ICF, a terrific uh, consulting firm, is uh, doing a study for us of the financial uh, opportunities um, and uh, with, with microgrids. Uh, and they will look at three very concrete study of opportunities at three different installations in three electricity markets. Uh, and then finally, Ben's Business Executives for National Security is looking at the business side of microgrids and the pros and cons of alternative business models. Should a microgrid be uh, government-owned and operated? Should it be government-owned, commercially operated, commercially owned and operated? That kind of thing. Should it stop at the fence line? Should it include critical activities in the community? 
What are the impediments to widespread uh, uh, deployment of microgrids? All right, finally, uh, uh, do you, as, as the microgrid example shows, we're, we are, uh, we can take advantage of advanced technology. Advanced technology has been DOD's comparative advantage for 200 years, going back to, if not before, uh, Eli Whitney and uh, the development of interchangeable machine-made parts for musket production, which is what became the American system of manufacturing. We are, at the end of the day, DOD is a technology uh, agency. It's our comparative advantage. Uh, in the facility energy area, we're not going to be a developer of technology. We don't need to be. Our, there is a lot of great technology out there. It's coming out of uh, industry with backing from venture capital with a lot of historic support from the Department of Energy. Uh, there's a lot of technology out there. What we can do is, uh, let me go back one, is be a, use our installations as a test bed for next generation energy technology, for pre-commercial energy technology. Um, energy technology, particularly building energy efficiency technology, faces a, uh, a lot of impediments to commercialization. Uh, the first user of the technology bears significantly greater costs and gets no additional return compared to the second, the second user. Uh, there are a variety of impediments that make this technology uh, slow to get to market. We, we think we have an important role to play there and we think it's in our self-interest because we have 300,000 buildings. You look, you look at risk differently when you have 300,000 buildings. It makes sense for us to try out a lot of these things to be a test bed. And if, uh, if seven of them work and three of them don't, we come, out, we come out way ahead by being able to deploy the seven that, that work and uh, ignore the ones that don't. There aren't very many building owners that, that approach new technology with that with that attitude. Walmart is one of the ones that does, and it's because they, like us, are a huge building owner. So we've, we're using the, uh, a, a program um, that uh, was developed to do environmental technology demonstrations to do energy technology demonstrations on our installations. And it's a very, uh, the concept is, it's a distributed test bed so these projects are awarded competitively and they've been huge, hugely, uh, there's been a huge demand for this, so we're only able to fund a small number of them. Uh, but uh, the program is focused on three areas, smart microgrids and uh, advanced microgrids and storage, number one, uh, energy efficient buildings, second, and then renewable and on-site uh, technology, uh, renewable technology, third. Um, and let me give you a couple of examples. We have, I mentioned microgrids. We have about 10 demonstration projects going on in the microgrid and storage area. The flagship project is GE's smart microgrid technology at 29 Palms, a Marine Corps base in the Mojave Desert. Um, Lockheed Martins at Fort Bliss. Uh, and a variety of others. Uh, United Technologies at Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst, uh, and then we have a, a number of storage demonstrations going going on as well. We have a very deep test and evaluation culture in the Defense Department that so this takes advantage of that, and we are and as I indicated earlier, the focus of a lot of this is on how how to incorporate renewable energy uh, at at high penetrations. That is the big technical challenge. Um, the second focus is on uh, energy efficient uh, buildings, and let me just give you uh, give you talk about one example there that I think illustrates why we can play such an important role as a test bed. Electrochromic windows in the uh, in the upper left. These are self tinting uh, windows. I'm sorry, not all of you can 
uh, see the slides. Um, these are windows that, that tint automatically. They tint electronically like, dark, like glasses that, that get darker when you go out in the sun and then lighten up when you come back inside. Um, this is a technology that DOE has supported uh, over the years. Uh, it's a, it's a, a good technology. It's still expensive. There are, vent there's two uh, there are venture capital firms now backing two producers of it. Um, the one pictured is Solidime. Um, the reason a test bed is helpful here is because these, these are expensive windows. What they promise, if they, if, they, if they work and if people like working in buildings that have these kind of windows, uh, you, don't, you, you can reduce your air conditioning costs significantly, but more important, you can, when you build a building to start with, you can put in a smaller chiller. That reduced capital investment is enormous. That, that is the big payoff from this sort of a technology, put it, being able to put smaller chillers in your building. Architecture and engineering, A&E firms make the decision about how big the chiller should be when you build a building. There, no A&E firm is going to take a chance on putting in these windows without absolute uh, absolutely compelling evidence that that they're going to work because you don't get you don't get in trouble by putting in too big a chiller if you're an A firm you get in a lot of trouble if you build a building and the chiller is too small so you need compelling rigorous data on the performance of these of of this kind of a technology and how people like. Uh, like working in a building that has them. And that hasn't happened to date. We're putting them in on three sides of a building at uh, Miramar Marine Corps Air Station in San Diego, and we think we'll get that kind of data. Uh, let me give you, uh, the in the lower left is a, uh, this is a, an air conditioning, it's a, a nanotechnology, a nanomembrane that, um, dehumidifies air without cooling it. This was an ARPA-E funded project, one of ARPA-E's early projects. We're testing it at, uh, at Robin air For Robbins Air Force Base in uh, Georgia where it's very humid. Um, oh, some really interesting technologies for doing expedited audits, uh, for figuring out where to invest our uh, our dollars without doing the, the really elaborate sort of audits that are normally required. And then uh, technology to allow continuous building commissioning technology that will allow us to um, operate our buildings uh, uh, much more efficiently. That's where a lot of the energy loss is. You build them, they're optimal, they're, they perform optimally when they're built, and then they degrade fairly quickly over time. And there's some interesting technologies that will allow us to optimize in an ongoing basis. Um, and then finally, um, uh, technologies in the, uh, uh, in the renewable on-site generation area, and I'll mention uh, maybe one or two of them. In the upper right, um, this is a, a microturbine produced by a, a little startup called Flex Energy. Um, it, it turns uh, uh, exhaust gas at a landfill into electricity. We have several hundred landfills uh, on DOD installations. We generate electricity from, from the landfills, but as the landfill ages, the waste gas, um, the exhaust gas, um, produces less and, fewer, less and less in the way of BTUs to the point that a conventional turbine can't generate power from it any longer. This technology uh, uh, will allow us to continue to generate electricity even from very low BTU waste gas. Uh, we're testing it at Fort Benning in Georgia. If it works there, it will work on uh, a lot of other DOD installations, and there are a lot of other folks who are watching this demonstration. If, if it works for us, they think it will work for them as well, state and municipal governments, even some commercial entities. So again, it's where we can play an important role as a test bed. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll skip over those. Um, let me mention just one last thing. Last week, uh, the Department of Energy, as you may know, has a program called SunShot. 
uh, and this is their, it's, it's uh, named after, after the, uh, the moonshot in that, uh, under President Kennedy in the 1960s. Sunshot's goal is to reduce the cost, the total cost of solar energy by solar energy systems by 75% by the end of the decade. One of the programs under Sunshot is called SunPath. Uh, uh, I can't remember what it stands for, but it's uh, uh, nascent. And anyway, SunPath is is focused on actually uh, ra ramping up production in the United States of some of this new technology. Uh, Sunshot announced awards last week to a couple a couple of companies out of a uh, uh, the results of a competition that they had held. One of the companies is Soytech, uh, Soytech Solar. It's the U.S. subsidiary of, uh, of a international company, Soytech. Uh, Soytech manufactures concentrating PV modules. Uh, it's a very pioneering technology that offers significantly greater um, efficiency. Um, so DOE announced an award of money to, uh, to Soytech to further that technology. And they also announced that we will be, we DOD will be demonstrating that technology uh, at two installations at uh, Fort Irwin is one and another one to, yet to be decided. Fort Irwin is an army base in the Mojave Desert. And at each of those installations, we will uh, um, demonstrate this at the one megawatt scale. DOE will pay for the modules, so the first however many hundred modules that come off of the assembly line, DOD, DOE will buy them. We will pay for the balance of systems, everything else uh, but the modules and the cost of installation. Uh, it's a it's a win-win. DOE, uh, DO, we get cutting edge renewable energy technology at a, at a real discount and DOE gets a uh, a rigorous demonstration and validation of this technology by uh, a uh, by an entity us that is a uh, potentially very large customer. So it's a real win-win. We hope to be doing a lot more of this with the Sunshot Initiative, and then we also hope to have a similar kind of partnership with the Department of Energy's building R&D program, so that those technologies that DOE is supporting. The last stop on the path is a is a demonstration on a military base. So there's a lot of uh, opportunities. Um, uh, we are focused on uh, a couple of we've got a couple of big challenges, and I think I'll just skip over that. And if somebody wants to ask me about this on the Q and A, that's fine. I've taken up too too much time. Uh, let me yeah. So all right, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. Thanks. Yeah. And I should mention also that the slides from um, this panel will be available on EESI's website. Um, and, uh, and of course, that's EESI.org. We're now going to hear from two of the services. And, uh, and first, uh, we will hear from John Leshetsky, who is the Executive Director for the Army Energy Initiatives Task Force in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Installations energy and the environment and he will then be followed by captain uh carrie gilpin uh with the u.s navy and who is and he is the director of the one gigawatt task force in the office of the deputy assistant secretary of the navy for energy okay john so good morning everyone and, and thank you carol for that introduction uh I think uh, there's two points I want to make. I guess number one is is that what the Army is doing is is exactly in line uh, with the foundation and the the framework that Dr. Rabin, uh, Rabin uh, outlined. Specifically, that it's very much focused on energy security. Uh, energy security uh, begins with the soldier for the Army. Uh, the uh, soldier needs to fight. He needs needs to be sustained in the battlefield. He needs to be housed uh, in installations, and he needs some mobility in the battlefield uh, to conduct operations. 
So when we talk about energy security, it's very, very much focused on the soldier and all the things that are needed to make the soldier effective uh, in wartime and in, in times of peace as well. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go through these points very, very quickly and then um, uh, concentrate on, in a little bit more detail, the work that we're doing with the Energy Efficiency or Energy Initiatives Task Force, uh, which really is the, the central management office for the Army's renewable energy efforts. Uh, but I did want to just touch on a few points. Uh, number one, that the uh, Army framework or, or the uh, Army program uh, for energy is really uh, centralized around four different points. Uh, changing the culture, making sure that every soldier understands that they are a power manager. And this really starts at the top. And the best evidence of that is that energy is now part of the Army's campaign plan, the Army strategic plan for how all general officers manage the day-to-day -day and strategic operations of the Army. Uh, energy security, installation energy, operational energy are all a part of the Army campaign plan. Similar uh, to what um, uh, was said before, uh, reducing energy efficiency or increasing energy efficiency, reducing energy demand across the services um, or across all installations, uh, building uh, resilience through renewable energy and alternative energy, and certainly the Energy Initiatives Task Force, the use of large-scale renewable energy is a central part of that effort, and then continuing to build a capability with science and technology. So just very highlighting, uh, very much a highlight of some of the things that the Army has accomplished already uh, in terms of building standards. I'll leave that for your reference. I did want to key on uh, one particular point. Uh, the White House recently um, announced a um, goal for across the, uh, the federal sector for there to be $2 billion in energy uh, savings performance contracts uh, over the next two years. The Army's share of that would be about $400 million. Well, the Army already believes that we're going to accomplish $800 million of ESPC contracts uh, over that time frame. So the Army believes that through improved uh, processes and installations uh, and procedures that the speed and pace and the volume of ESPC contracts can be significantly increased. Two different initiatives, um, one, the Energy Initiatives Task Force, the second, the Net Zero Program. The Net Zero program is focused on 17 specific pilot installations uh, and developing roadmaps to make them zero uh, impact in terms of waste, water, and energy. All three of those things are interrelated to some extent. And to be able to ex essentially develop best practices and make sure that those are developed through roadmaps and then those are uh, communicated to other installations as well. Uh, so all of those uh, installations were identified in 2011. All of those have a goal of reaching net, their net zero status by 2020. Um, there was some discussion about microgrids, and certainly the Army is very, very active in microgrids. There are 28 different microgrids currently in Afghanistan. Uh, as well as looking at microgrids at U.S. installations as well. Uh, the impact is reduced diesel fuel in the field, and that has immediate impact in terms of a uh, number of uh, fuel convoys, number of flights to deliver fuel. Uh, ultimately, that also uh, results on reduced casualties, both loss of limb and both loss of life uh, in terms of minimizing diesel fuel usage and better energy efficiency within the field. Uh, a lot was already said about science and technology investment strategies or in, and, and the number of different investments that DOD is making, uh, and I'll just leave that for your reference. So the uh, Energy Initiatives Task Force uh, is a specific program that was announced by the Secretary of Army in September of last year, and it really is focused about moving renewable energy projects forward at an increased rate. Uh, to date, the Army has done about 168 renewable energy projects, that has gotten it less than 1% to its ultimate goal, which is being driven by, in part, the National Defense Authorization Act for, for 2010. Uh, so to make that goal a reality and to put the Army on a glide path uh, to achieve that requires large-scale energy projects, so something on the order of 1 megawatt, 5 megawatt, 10 megawatt projects. Um, when you do those types of projects, there are significant challenges in terms of regulation, in terms of interconnection, in terms of environmental permitting. 
that have been a challenge to each one of the installations and have kept them from achieving those goals. So the EITF was essentially set up to concentrate the Army's effort at one central office to provide the expertise, the resources, the capabilities to work with each installation uh, to uh, execute these projects. Now, I should have said that all these projects are being executed with third-party financing. Uh, they, again, will be, used, will be using private sector money. Uh, developers, contractors will be selected. They will be brought in uh, to build these systems. But ultimately, the only thing that the government is purchasing is electricity and does not actually own these systems over, over their life. Congress has given us the capability to execute these programs under uh, USC 2922A which gives the Department of Energy a 30-year PPA authority, a power purchase uh, agreement authority. So what you see now, and I think you'll, you'll see it also from Captain Gilpin's presentation, all three services are now moving very um, uh, deliberately uh, to exercise the congressional authority that's already been given, but which each service has, I think, struggled to, to implement and execute over the last several years. So the EITF is focused on 10 megawatts and above and removing these roadblocks to these large projects. Um, also has made the uh, commitment with the Navy and the Air Force to uh, deploy one gigawatt of renewable energy uh, by 2025. Uh, we are looking through innovative acquisition approaches. One thing that we have uh, developed uh, with the U.S. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers in Huntsville is this concept of a multi-order task order contract. Uh, we can talk more about that, but this would give us a very quick acquisition capability for these types of projects and has a ceiling of approximately $7 billion uh, over the life of these 25, 30-year contracts. And we believe that we'll be releasing that sometime this summer, uh, hopefully by the end of uh, July. Uh, we have screened over 180 uh, DOD, excuse me, Army and Army National Guard installations. We understand what the economics are. We understand where are the most favorable projects. And we have begun due diligence on a number of those projects to qualify them as projects that will, or opportunities that will go out into the private sector. Um, last week, we had an industry day with the Air Force. We had over 800 uh, participants uh, from industry and parts of government. Uh, where we announced four projects which we're going to release uh, to acquisition over the next uh, several months. Uh, as you can see up there, there's Fort Irwin. Probably you can't see. The site's kind of small. Fort Irwin in, um, in uh, California, 20 megawatt solar installation. Um, a 20 megawatt solar installation in Fort Bliss in Texas a 15 megawatt solar installation in Fort Detrick in Maryland, and then finally a 50 megawatt bioelectric uh, plant uh, in Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. Uh, these are all being executed with different business models. In some cases, we are partnering very closely with the local utilities uh, because we believe it's important to make sure that we continue to have that good relationship. Uh, in some cases, we will be going out directly with developers uh, and partnering with developers through competitive processes. But just these four projects alone show that uh, the EITF is making some good progress over the last nine months. Uh, this puts the Army 10 percent toward its goal and effectively is a 10 times increase from where the Army uh, has been in, in terms of renewable energy project uh, deployment. So with that, uh, I'll just let you know that we do have a booth uh, here today, and we have several members. Uh, if, uh, if you'd like to ask us questions uh, after the session, I'd uh, be glad to, uh, to answer them at that time. So thank you all very much. Good morning. Uh, the good thing about going last is that uh, a lot of what I was going to say has already been said, so I don't need to, to replow that ground. Uh, it shouldn't surprise you that much of what the Navy is doing aligns quite nicely with what uh, OSD uh, uh, has implemented and uh, what our, our other services are also doing. So uh, that, that really does let me skip through some of these points that I would normally make. Um, let me just first describe what the Navy's one gigawatt task force is and, and what it isn't. Uh, 
it, it actually supports, it's not a new goal, it supports Secretary Mabus's previously stated uh, energy goal of 50% uh, of the shore installation power uh, for all Navy and Marine Corps installations will come from alternative sources by 2020. So it's a bit of a, a stretch goal for the Navy Department. Uh, the, the NDAA 10 uh, guidance was 25% by 25. We're, we're going to try to to get beyond that. And, and by the way, I think we all consider these numbers to be floors and not ceilings. So if we get beyond that, that's, that's even better. Um, so uh, as uh, the President announced uh, in his national um, e emphasis on a different sort of uh, energy uh, climate for the United States, uh, Navy Department is going to support this uh, goal. The way we're going to do this is um, Secretary Mabus, after this announcement, stood up the task force, and the task force will deliver to uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy, Installations, and Environment a strategy by the end of uh, this fiscal year, September, um, that will outline a way for the department to achieve this goal by 2020. So uh, I'm happy to talk to folks afterward and, and in, in my office or, or wherever, I'll, I can talk to anyone because I can't sign contracts. So the difference, one of the differences between uh, the way the different services are structured is that uh, in, in our office, um, we, we're more focused on the policy and the how and the why, and then other uh, agencies, particularly uh, NAVFAC, Naval Facilities Engineering Command, they're the ones who actually um, will, will introduce the rubber to the road and, and get these things going. So. We will deliver to, to, uh, to the Secretary um, in September this plan. And uh, the way we're going to go about this is we have sort of a three-part strategy, assess, engage, and then act. Uh, those are not necessarily sequential. In fact, they really can't be because the assessment is ongoing, the engagement is, is ongoing, and then the action will, will take place when we're ready to do that. Um, so in the assessment phase, which uh, really was underway before the task force was formally stood up, uh, but we sort of brought a new emphasis to that, uh, we'll look at, at any and all studies that, that, uh, that pertain, and uh, Dr. Robon mentioned some of those. Uh, there's an NREL study, uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, that's uh, it's, it's focusing on the net zero portion of, of, of Secretary Mavis's energy goals but it'll help us figure out renewable energy options for each of our installations. We also uh, will leverage off of the ICF Desert Southwest study that's, that was recently completed. Again, another OSD initiative. Um, I don't know, probably many of you have seen that or heard of it. Seven gigawatts of, of solar PV potential in the Desert Southwest. Of course, there are many uh, things that the study didn't, co didn't cover. Uh, BLM lands for one, uh, market price points, uh, transmission capacity, all those things uh, will make or break a lot of these uh, projects for us, so um, we, the assessments are ongoing, of course. All renewable energy technologies are on the table. Some work better than, than others. Uh, some are uniquely suited to specific installations. Much of our ranges, are, many of our ranges in the desert southwest Lots of sun, um, there may be some wind out there, but the wind sort of, the, the towers sort of interfere with the operations that go on on those ranges and those bases and the, and the radars that we, of course, have to use out there. So just a couple of uh, quick examples. One of, the, one of the overriding factors in figuring out what works where uh, is that these technologies have to support the mission at the installation and not interfere with it. We face, uh, I mentioned transmission, that, that's one of the biggies that, that, that we really have to, you know, we sort of have to, to crack that nut. Mr. Leshetsky mentioned, you know, the, 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 we're looking at the similar size projects as Army. Uh, of course, the bigger you go, then, then that introduces other problems. It, 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 they're easier to finance. The, the, the third party financing companies are more interested in larger deals. It, it works out better for them but it's harder for the PUCs and the ISOs and everyone else to figure out. 
I'll give you a quick example. We're looking at a, a, an air station in, in the West where uh, it, it's Navy-owned land, so we don't have to, to negotiate with, with BLM on that one. We, there's, there's enough land that we have available to us to, to develop projects. We could go as high as 100 megawatts, uh, actually, two, sorry, 200 megawatts based on the land that we have. However, if we get above 90 or 100, that's going to trigger uh, transmission grid upgrades that the developer is, or is on the hook to pay for, and uh, the, the, the regulations uh, associated with those are, are a little bit complicated, as I'm sure many of you are, are aware. So those kinds of things we, we still have to figure out and, and, uh, and find out what works and, and, and what developers can do and what financiers will back and what the, the Navy Department can actually support. The, uh, the business issues, the other business issues, of course, the tax credits that are, that are a, a topic of discussion now, those will affect the way the, the deals work out. Um, terminate for convenience clause bothers some people, but uh, it, it really shouldn't, and I can talk more about that later. Um, th that all, you know, we, we not only do we not know all the, the answers, we, we don't really know all the questions, and so we have to continue to engage. Um, the, uh, the ACOR event up in New York this week, the Renewable Energy Financing Forum, uh, that was an opportunity f uh, for, for m many of us to engage with the financing side. Um, that's just an example. Uh, we've done other ACOR events. Uh, we, we've done other engagements with industry, both in the industry day forum type venue as well as one-on-one -on -one visits uh, in our offices to talk about these things and figure out what all the questions are, and then try to work toward those those answers. But it's 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 not just the Navy Department. It's not just uh, the developers. It's it's the other branches of government within DOD, DOE, obviously, um, all of that, and then and then uh, our other our sister services as well. So finally, when we when we sort all that out and we get down to to the, to the actually developing projects. Uh, as, as Mr. Leshevsky uh, described for Army, Navy's also uh, flipping the switch on some projects. I, I accompanied Mr. Hicks out to Miramar last week uh, where we brought online a 3.2 megawatt uh, landfill gas capture uh, generation uh, system uh, on base at Miramar, Marine Corps Air Station Miramar. Uh, there, there may be another three megawatts that we can, that we can uh, Acquire as part of the same project. Uh, we we like the we like the base power type uh, generation in a, in a 24 seven rather than the intermittent. The intermittent is is uh, obviously our, our one of our biggest options, our biggest uh, opportunities. But the the sources that provide that that 24 seven power uh, those those really represent the the ideal type of energy security that we're after. So that, that uh, methane capture system I just described at Miramar uh, can provide almost half, about 45% of the entire base's load on a 24-7 basis with or without the rest of the, the Southern California grid, uh, uh, whether it's operating or not. Uh, and it can, it can provide all the power that the flight line needs to do its critical missions there. So that, that, that sort of project we really uh, like a lot. We still pursue all the others. Um, we're about ready to, uh, to uh, cut the ribbon at uh, a project at China Lake. It's 13.8 mega, uh, megawatts of, of uh, solar PV. Uh, that's a, a, a um, there are several projects at, at China Lake. I'm sure you're all aware of the geothermal. We, we love geothermal for the same reasons I just described. Um, but the PV is, is a mature technology, low risk, and uh, developers like it and financiers like it. So we need to find the projects that work and that are suited for the bases that where we're trying to, to generate this energy security. Okay. We only went a few minutes over. <laughs> Tried to blaze through that as quickly as I could. Um, so when, when the... Uh, when the strategy is finished in, in September, we expect we'll be able to, 
to present that uh, to the public at the Navy Energy Forum in October. So I think I'll stop there. I think I touched on the highest highlights and uh, turn it back over to Carol. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And we look forward to following up with all of you, and perhaps we can bring you all back in the fall with all of these new reports that are coming out and to really look at the progress. So, so uh, we would look forward to that. And unfortunately, we are out of time with regard to this, but please, I know that the, uh, the Army does have a booth, and so you can hear more about what both the Army and the other services are doing from them. And um, I just want to thank our panel very, very much. And I hope this helps everybody understand all of the exciting things and the leadership that is coming forward in terms of moving re all forms of renewable energy, many, many different kinds of energy efficiency applications forward in terms of really being a leading test bed, a real way to put American ingenuity and innovation um, out, out in front and leading the way. So thank you very, very much. Really appreciate your being here.